are back live in the secret stash. I'm your host, Jesse Abanez, co-founder of the Greenhouse Group. And we're located right down here in the heart of San Diego and uh, helping move folks into and out of homes. You might say that's my day job, David, and uh, moving some people with purpose down there. And by the way, we've got some brand new listings that just came up on the market. And uh, you're going to want to check them out if you're even remotely thinking about buying a crib right now before this whole interest rate game hmm. is a thing of the past. Because those two in particular happen to be existing at 5 and 7% under market right now. And they're both brand new on the inside. So go check them out. Go down to uh, thegreenhousegroupinc.com and you'll check our feature listings top right of the page. David is in the house with us now today, though, from SD3D, and I'm loving this conversation, David. This is something that's got me all giddy. I was thinking about it all week long because I really, truly believe that 3D printing is going to change the world. I just don't know how yet, and I love that, that you're willing to come in and, and help us get a little bit clearer on this. And so the if you can think about maybe that as the frame, chief on that list of whose world this is going to change probably first and quickest is going to be inventors. Oh, yeah. Right? So why don't you bring us down that little rabbit hole for, uh, along, along with you there? Oh, man, there's, there's just so many, um, so many different examples of inventors that we've helped out. One, one of the most recent ones I would say that's come up is um, a company out of, uh, out of San Diego called NXT, and they're building a, a service robot that um, – Originally, they were trying to put it into, you know, uh, casinos and hotels and stuff like that so that instead of having your bellman come to, like, serve you, you know, whatever, it happens to be your meal in the middle of the night, you would have a little robot come over there. But there is kind of an, an issue with the ideation on that because there's some, you know, pushback to having robots, you know, just in your social sphere all the time. <laughs> so, you know, I, I got introduced to Jeff, the, the CEO of NXT, and I was like, uh, I could really use your robot, and I don't have any fears of robots because that's all we do. We hang out with robots all the time. Yeah. So now, um, you know, we've kind of helped him pivot into this direction. We've helped him with, you know, redesigning it so that it's actually an industrial robot now, and we're actually going to end up using that robot to take prints off of our printer and, and you know, automatically bring them to secondary post-processing stations so that we don't have to have a technician continuously doing that. So, and, so it's it's almost going to be like uh, like the the Ford Model T, exactly. Except without the conveyor belt. It, exactly, yeah. it, it's exact p perfectly. I mean, literally, um, you know, they're about to launch their crowdfunding campaign, and uh, one of the coolest things about it is we're going to be literally taking their robots that they're going to be you know funding through their campaign, and you know they're going to be taking them off the printer to build more robots with those robots. It's, uh, it's that <laughs> that's some like sci-fi stuff right there. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how excited I am for that to get started. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. So, so now the, the the reason why I think inventors is atop this list is because one of the well, I would say outside of money, of course, right? It seems to always be the chief mm -hmm. uh, challenge for any inventor trying to bring their thing to the awareness of of let alone to market, um, th just of the inv in the the investors that they need to help get them there, right? Mm -hmm. So. If you look at maybe five, ten years ago, how that process would look versus now or even five, ten years in the future, yeah. what's going to be the main shift that you're going to see with the induction of uh, 3D printing into that conversation? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I mentioned my, my uncle earlier in the show and how he, you know, spent over $20,000 on four prototypes, you know, a couple decades ago. That, the, the, the screw thing the with the The screw thing, exactly. Yeah. And, and the design was basically identical. I took his old blueprints and I just made it the same thing and I made it for a few hundred dollars. And so that's where, where we've already gone. We've gone from a couple, you know, tens of thousands of dollars down to a few hundred for prototyping. And now this next step for us is really, you know, at, at that stage you have a prototype and you, and you know it works, but there's still a problem because you need to be able to bring that to market. You need to be able to manufacture it so that people can buy it. And the old school way of doing that is something called injection molding. Um, mm. You uh, basically make a, a mold out of that part which is very, very costly to do. And then you inject, you know, molten plastic into it over and over and over again. It's really set up for really large volume manufacturing. Okay. Not so much for testing out a market or crowdfunding or, or it's just not set up for the little guy. And so what the next step for 3D printing is, is actually to allow, you know, inventors, once they know and they've, you know, iterated through their prototypes to actually bring their product to market directly from 3D printed parts. And so right, that, and we're not there yet. We're not. We're well. SD three D is starting to you know pioneer in that direction through our printer farm program. We've been so able. So what's the gap? 
The the gap so the gap is being able to fulfill your first about five thousand units in order to really test and validate your market hmm. to show that there is a market there because. You know, it's a cat and mouse game. If you if you go out and you try to raise money and you're like, I have the best invention in the world, look at my prototype, guess what every single investor is going to ask you? Have you actually tried to sell it? How yeah, many sales gonna, do you have? Yeah. What's That's your revenue? That's all they care about. That's all they care about. So you get into this cat and mouse game of, okay, I need to make some sales, but how do I actually manufacture the part to make those sales? Right. So in order to do that, you know, for the last, basically forever, you've had to you know, raise tens of thousands to millions of dollars, depending on how complex your project is, just to get it off the ground to even test it. And you're not even sure that, you know, its incarnation, however you've prototyped it, is right for the market. Mm. You may have to iterate a couple more times and then reinvest all over again. And so what, you know, our whole printer farm program and, and production fulfillment through 3D printing is going to allow uh, inventors to do is to test their market. We can, you know, today actually fulfill up to 5,000 units um, a year for any of those inventors and at a uh, lower, much lower cost than they would uh, be dealing with if they were going through injection molding. Un understood completely. And I, I think I think if there's ever a theme that hopefully is rising up to the top like truth for everybody who's tuning in right now for the first time and hearing this message, it's that. Yeah. It's the law of ubiquity, you might say, of making everything more uh, available and then, of course, cheaper as a result. Exactly. Now, uh, let's, let's dumb this down a little bit, if, if I might. I know that might be hard for you, okay. um, but um, so let's say I'm trying to build a, a water bottle as mm -hmm. I'm staring at it across the table right now, right? So, so how does that process actually look like? Like I'm like, I'm the inventor, I've mm -hmm. created the coolest water bottle ever, I hand it to you, then what happens? Oh, well, that's an interesting situation. So you've actually, say, hand molded something, sure, carved it, something like that. Sure, let's just say that. that, yeah. All right, so now you're bringing in the 3D scanning process, which is a whole other you know, realm of what we do. So... There's two um, front end sides of our business, which is either you know 3D scanning a physical physical object that already exists, and then there's you know 3D design itself in CAD or CAM programs. That's what I was gonna. Ask. So it's a CAD based thing. It's a CAD Got based it. thing, yeah. So, um, but you can also literally take a physical item, um, scan it in three dimensions down to you know very very fine resolution and. You know, there's automated cleanup tools to the, to the point where you can basically copy something that's right on your desk. Mm. And so there's that that's whole thing, deadly. too. That's really deadly because you could take something, you could just see something, you're like, oh, it'd be really nice if I could just change that just a little bit. Just a little bit. So you, you take it, you scan it, um, and within 10 minutes, you could just tweak it slightly and get it on the printer so that when you come back from work, you get to test it out. It's almost like I remember growing up, I don't even know if this is their slogan anymore, but you remember the company 3M? Oh yeah, I do. Right, the post yeah. and stuff. Their whole slogan was, "We don't make the thing; we make it better." Yeah, you know, and I love that thought. Like, because that's for me anyway. I, that's usually how I see the lens of the world. It's really exhausting with your resources of your energy and your time to just like confect something out of thin air that exactly. never existed before. However, it's far more. Um, uh, likely that you'll just see something and you'll have that inspirational aha moment to be yes. like, oh, that thing could be a little better, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, the necessity being the mother of invention, you know, you have to have the physical, sometimes even tactical um, uh, element first working before you can have that moment of inspiration. And then so imagine what the process of that has looked like since the beginning of time, back to old Ben Franklin, mm -hmm. of what would have to go on there and the, and the amount of exhaustion of resources versus just handing the thing over to you and saying, hey, David, I, I, I'd like a little handle on the side of this. Go ahead and cook this up for me. Yeah, that's, that's the beauty of it. That's exactly what we do. People walk through our doors every day with that exact statement. And we get it. We get no, their no, no, product. No, that was mine. That's my invention. That's yours. That's yours. Okay. Well, yeah. We'll take care of it for you. We got yeah. you. But um, no, I mean that's that's really the beauty and the beauty of the vision, right? Because the way that we feel that we're going to change the world is by being able to allow those thoughts, those those innovative thoughts, to actually manifest themselves. All the thoughts throughout time very, very small fraction of them, of those innovations, actually have ever come to market. And the main reason for that is because of how complex that process is. And that's becoming so much simpler because of what we're doing with 3D printing, scanning, and design. Man, I love that thought. I mean, it's like, it's one of those total explosion, you know, like if I, if I was Funk Master Flex and I had the, the drop the bomb button over here on the keypad, like I'd, I'd be doing it right now. So, okay. So what about cost? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I would say that that would be sort of the elephant in the room right now. Let's yep. say someone even has that water bottle idea, and they're like, "Hold on a second, I don't want to go sit down and talk to David if this is going to cost me a, you know, a taking a third out 
a third mortgage out on my oh, house. Yeah, no way. So, so, so talk to me about cost. Yeah, so um, perfect example is going back to the coffee mug. Everybody has an idea of what that would look like. It's basically a thermos, 20-ounce thermos, right? So the cost for me to design that um, was about $400, and then to print it out was about $50 each. And we were able to do that continuously every day as long as, you know, he wanted to print out new prototypes, and we'd iterate. And, you know, we charge $50 an hour for, for our design, which I think is Dude, fairly modest. totally reasonable. Yeah, completely reasonable. So, and, and these are, you know, certified mechanical design engineers that, you know, are either, you know, fresh out of college or even have, you know, 10 years of experience. We have everything in between. And we also have, you know, designers that specifically focus on organic modeling. So the type of digital design, you know, uh, making characters and stuff like that, if you're more into the artsy type of stuff. Yeah. So, so David, is this going to be the new code? Yeah, it, is this going to be the new Silicon Valley, uh, you know, code writing rug rat? Oh yeah, yeah. And there's the reason why we're in San Diego. You know, I mentioned all the all the entrepreneurs here. I really think San Diego is the new Silicon Valley. It's um, say more about that because yeah. I I believe you, but I don't hear anybody else talking about it. Yeah, you know, I mean, there you're right. There aren't enough people talking about it. See. San Diego is kind of, to me, what Silicon Valley really was about 20 years ago. It's it's a bunch of scrappy people in their garage. It's a bunch of entrepreneurs with like great yourself. ideas. Like exactly. yourself. You started this in your garage, right? Yeah, and there's it's it's amazing to me how many people have just come to me with similar stories. And they're just they're, they're not innovating because there's you know tons of money being thrown at them. They're innovating because they really need to out of necessity because of what whatever business, whatever you know industry they're currently in just needs that innovation. And uh, it's that kind of raw talent of entrepreneurship that our kind of service really can, you know, profit from. I know we're coming up on a break here, but I want to uh, put you in the hot seat. Is this the beginning of the end of China? <laughs> Actually, it's great that you say that. Our um, our slogan, uh, our slogan is Operation Save China. That's that's what we say every day, and we have it up on the whiteboard <laughs> because. Because, I mean, what we're doing is replacing little Chinese fingers that are assembling things all day long. I mean, they don't need to be doing that. They have better things to do with their time. They're innovative people, too. I, I think uh, that that's probably one of the, uh, the underwritten laws of this evolution is that the, the way that the world behaves right now, and, and China's largely been the benefactor of that, through the slave labor, if I might even say that, mm -hmm. of countless of thousands and thousands of its people. And yeah, they'll still be able to sell to their base. But I think this is the beginning of the end of that whole un imbalance. Would you not agree? Exactly. Exactly. And, and the future is really bright for us to be able to do that. Yeah. I love that thought. Is, is 3D printing um, germane to uh, San Diego? I mean, uh, to the United States? Uh, it's actually 3D printing is the most popular in Europe right now. Uh, was it invented in Europe? Uh, the uh, the open source aspect of it um, was largely developed through through Europe, but I mean it's it. been Europe and the United States uh, in a collaboration. Got it. Well, listen, man. I, I, as, as you can tell, I'm chomping at the bit right now, but we got to got to get people caught up. I mean, this is ESPN after all. So coming up on a little sports break, get people all caught up on scores and uh, some insight and whatnot. And when we come back, what about 3D printing in the home? Hanging out with my man David Freeney of SD3D.com. We'll be right back in the stash.